Well, welcome, everyone, gathering family. Welcome to our online family. We're in our sixth and final week of our deeper series where we're learning how to, to go deeper in our faith. I was thinking about life this week, and life really is all about what we can see. Think about success. How do we measure success in life? By what is observed, by what is seen, by results, by performance, by what you produce. Life is measured by what is seen. We're taught to uh, pay attention to what is seen at a very young age. Anybody travel across country and ever play the slug bug game? Yeah, you're taught to look for slug bugs. If you see a Volkswagen Beetle, you see it first, you say slug bug, and then you get to, yeah, punch someone in the car. Or if you see a, a yellow car, some of you played the banana game, you shout out banana. Or if you see a car with one headlight, you shout out. See, that's the funny thing. It depends geographically where you're located. For us Ohio peeps, it was perdiddle. Yeah, perdiddle. Thank you, Vince. But for some people, I actually did a little research in certain parts of the country. It's padoodle or padungle. Or if LaMonica were here, she'd probably say bedazzle. <laughs> Just saying. And then there's the I spy game, right? The I spy some. We're taught to pay attention to what we see. Life is largely a measure of what we can See, But when it comes to going deeper, when it comes to our faith, when it comes to things of depth, spiritual depth, it's a measure more of what we can't see. Many of us were like this, uh, this broken light. This was in my kitchen for about two months, and it was flickering incessantly. And, and we could probably relate to that, right? Maybe someone has a flickering faith. Maybe your faith is kind of on sometimes, and then sometimes it's off. Sometimes you're hot, maybe sometimes you feel like you're cold. Sometimes you feel like, man, I'm on fire for Christ, and other days you feel like, man, I am so shallow. I need help. So what did I do? For two months, we observed the external. We observed what we can see and so surely it must be the light bulb. So for two months, between Levi, Levi and myself, we probably changed six light bulbs to no avail. The fix was actually much deeper. Turn to your neighbor and say, it's what you can't see. It's what you can't see. Because if you unscrew this light bulb, you'll see that inside here, much deeper into the canister, there's a thermal switch, thermal protect switch, which basically tells it to shut off if it overheats. Well, the thermal switch was faulty. It was bad. It was something you couldn't see. Here's what I'm saying. Sometimes when it comes to things of depth, measuring depth, it's not always visible. Is faith visible. Now we know that Hebrews eleven six. without faith, it's impossible to please God. Therefore, we can conclude that if we want to go deep with Jesus, we have to be men and women of faith. But is faith observable? Can you see faith? Hebrews 11, 1 gives us the best definition of faith. Faith is the assurance of what we hope for and the certainty of what we do not see. Turns out depth is a measure of what we do not see. I guess my question for us today is, are we certain of what we do not see? Because the answer to that question is a direct reflection of the measure of our faith. I'm calling this message, what you can't see. What you can't see. Numbers chapter 14 the year was 1446 B.C. Two million Israelites flee Egypt for the promised land of Canaan, 350 miles northeast. Over 14 months they've been in the desert now. They made it to uh, Kadesh, the southern perimeter. They're there. They're on the threshold of stepping into that promised land. What does Moses do? He picks out 12 spies, one from each of the tribes. 12 spies, and he sends them on a reconnaissance mission into the land of Canaan, into the promised land. 
10 spies come back with this report. They say that people are powerful. The cities have high walls and and we're like grasshoppers. They're going to devour us. We can't do it, the 10 spies said. But then there was a different report. Joshua and Caleb, their report was much different. In fact, in Numbers 1330, they said that we should go up and take possession of the land for we can certainly do it. Ooh, now wait a second. Ten spies were certain of what they could see. Two spies, men of faith, men of depth, were certain of what they could not see. It's what you can't see. Numbers 14, let's read. Uh, That night, all the members of the community raised their voices and wept aloud. All the Israelites grumbled against Moses and Aaron. And the whole assembly said to, to them, If we had only died in Egypt or in this wilderness, why is the Lord bringing us to this land only to let us fall by the sword? Our wives and our children will be taken as plunder. Wouldn't it be better for us to go back to Egypt? And they said to each other, we should choose a leader and go back to Egypt. Hmm. Go back to slavery, oppression, bondage? Really? Verse 5, then Moses and Aaron fell face down in front of the whole Israelite assembly. Gathered there, Joshua, son of Nun, and Caleb, son of Jephunneh, who were among those who had explored the land, tore their clothes and said to the entire Israelite assembly, the land we passed through and explored is exceedingly good. If the Lord is pleased with us, He will lead us into that land, a land flowing with milk and honey, and will give it to us. Only do not rebel against the Lord, and do not be afraid of the people of the land, because we will devour them. Their protection is gone, but the Lord is with us. Do not be afraid of them. Lord, thank you for that truth that was spoken 3,500 years ago, it's true today. You are with us. We can't always see you. We can't always see what you're doing, God. But we trust in you. Help us be certain of what we do not see, God. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's get into God's word today. First truth. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, you can clap. Yeah. Hey, if I'm going to be clapping for Chase Elliott today, we may as well give Jesus some praise. Amen. Come on, he's, he's more important than Chase. Number one, what you can't see can hurt you. Truth from God's word, what you can't see can hurt you. My son found this out the hard way. So uh, a couple weeks ago, when we were getting ready to go on vacation, he wanted to get some sunglasses. And so he went on sunglassesoutlet.com and he found a smoking deal on some Ray-Bans. He was so fired up. It was normally like, what's, go ahead and put that up there. It's normally like, if you can see the $83, it was down to $34.99. But what he didn't see was the word junior sunglasses. <laughs> and so when he rushed to open the package, this is what he saw. So unless you're under the age of three or your first name is Chachi, you will not be able to fit in these sunglasses. (laughs) He said, Dad, I just wasted $34. I said, no, you didn't. I'll pay you $35. Use it for a great sermon illustration. (laughs) I bought them. I bought them. It's worth every dollar. It was what he couldn't see. And the Israelites, what couldn't they see that hurt them? God's provision. They saw The problem. I guess what I'm asking is, do we see the problem? Or do we see God's provision? They saw the problem. That's why they whined. If we had only died in Egypt or this wilderness, why is this Lord bringing us to this land to to die by the sword? You really think God would go through all that trouble to free you from Egyptian slavery, only to bring you out to the desert to die? God didn't bring you this far to bring you this far. 
God brought you, he wants to bring you into a season of completion. Now that's on his time frame, and that might look a little different than what you, your expectation or your definition of what that looks like, but he's a God that believes in completing. Anybody, any ladies have a husband who like starts a project and doesn't finish? Don't you dare, you didn't! That was a trick! Don't raise your hand, that's terrible. We're starting our marriage series next month. No. I saw this the handyman ad. It said, we finished what your husband started. <laughs> that, that was good, man. That was, that was rich. God's not like that. God finishes what he started. Philippians 1, 6. He, he who began a good work will carry it on to completion. He completes what he starts. But what you can't see can hurt you. And I think, if we're honest, some of us, we've gotten comfortable at looking away. Sometimes we can't see it, but sometimes we can see it, and we just do one of these. I wonder how many people did one of these as six million Jews were killed in the Holocaust. I wonder how often as Americans, as Christians, since 1973, we looked away after Roe v. Wade and 63 million babies were aborted. I wonder now as our, our nation is in a f fight to redefine gender, I wonder if we just say, well, I guess that's just the way it's going to be. Or do we fight? Or do we stand what we believe? It's so easy. We've been getting comfortable looking away. I don't want to look away. Because poor sight has consequences. When we don't see the things of God, we choose to look away. Or if we don't see them, whether intentionally or by accident, there's consequences. What were the consequences for, for the Israelites? Well, anyone of military age, that being anyone who was 20 years of age or older, didn't get to go into the promised land. God said, you didn't see me, you didn't trust me, you're not going to the promised land. And for 40 years, one year for each day they explored the land, they had to wander that desert, 40 years, knowing that they would never see the promised land. And the 10 spies who just saw the giants and didn't see Jesus, what happened to them? They died of a plague. Poor sight has consequences. And I guess I'm just trying to be honest and say, what is it that you and I can't see? And maybe it's not just the work of God. Maybe sometimes what we can't see is ourself. You see, we're all made up of four boxes. Okay? And they totally switch these around. We are. They like to mess with me. So, awesome. I'll get you back, Shane. I promise. I got the microphone. So there's a box that everyone sees, right? That's like our personality. That's what you look like, maybe the clothes you wear, you know, just kind of the external stuff. And then there's the box that some see. There you go. There you go. Some see. That's more like your family, your friends, those who are a little closer to you, maybe a little more intimate. Then there's the box that only you see. That's like your, your thoughts, your hopes, your dreams, maybe your fears. That's real, real deep. But then there's the fourth box. And that's the box that everyone sees except for you. And that's the one I don't know why you're laughing when you're sitting right next to your husband. <laughs> Y'all will be in therapy next week. I'm just kidding. But that's the one, right, that everyone else sees. Like, man, Pastor John, he's a, really jerk. He's a real jerk, right? And, and, but, but I didn't know I was a jerk because no one told me, right? Uh, the things that everyone sees, but it's kind of like the elephant in the room, and no one, no one really ever tells you about it. Everyone should ask the question, how am I known? And you should find out the answer. Have people in your life. That's why we were big in family circles here. Because if you're in a family circle, you'll get close enough with someone who will actually tell you you're a jerk. I'm just saying. I've had people tell me that, and, and sometimes they're right. Uh, Proverbs 27.6. Wounds from a friend can be trusted, but an enemy multiplies kisses. Do you have wounds from a friend? If you do, that's a good thing. 
A friend who loves you enough to say what no one else will say, yet everyone else is thinking. I, I can use Mike P as an example because he's the only one I can know that won't get butt hurt. But uh, about three years ago, you called me up. You weren't, he wasn't even going to the, to the gathering, but he had known me from another church, and he called me up, and he said, my marriage is struggling. I need help. And so I went over there and met with he and his wife, he and Janet. And, and I know what he was thinking. He was thinking he was going to get some sort of Christian, you know, marshmallow counseling. Well, let's find some, some common ground. Okay. I want you to, when you look at Michael, what do you think? No, no, it wasn't, it wasn't like that. Like we got, we drilled down and, and, and I said to him, dude, you're being a jerk. You know, your anger's, the, the anger stuff is it, it, pushing her away. It's crippling her. You're going to lose her. Are you okay losing your wife? And at one point, it was pretty PO'd. Right? You were mad. You were, you, I thought you were fixing to come off that couch. But here's the thing. Three years later, you're one of the best husbands I know, man. You're one of the best dads I know. And listen, it wasn't because I said something so profound. I just said what no one else would say, but everyone else knew. And, and listen, this works both ways. In the lobby, you challenged me on something today, didn't you? I'm not making this stuff up. You can ask him. Did you, just, did you challenge me something on how I could be a better dad in the lobby? Yep, he sure did. See, that works both ways. Do you have a friend who can wound you in a good way, right? Who will speak what no one else will say because what you can't see can't hurt you. And listen, if you have a person of negativity in your life, and I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand because that person could be sitting right next to you. <laughs> but maybe you have a person of negativity in your life. And I, I just want to challenge you. What you can't see can hurt you. That negativity, it's got to go somewhere. You can't just absorb all of that and have no impact on you. So be careful. That's why we need people in your life to help speak into that person. But uh, let me just say this. Negative people need drama like oxygen. Stay positive and take away their breath. Amen? Starve that negativity because what you can't see can hurt you. And the second truth today is learn to see Jesus on your battlefield. And this is a big one. This is for somebody today. You came into church and, and you're like, you, you, you can't see Jesus. You, you got a whole big mess going on in your life and you're like, I need to see Jesus. Verse 9 Joshua and Caleb said, do not be afraid of the people of the land because we will devour them. Their protection is gone, but the Lord is with us. Somehow they could see a remnant of Jesus on that battlefield. Twelve spies, they didn't see different things. They saw things differently. They all saw 12 giants. Every one of them saw a giant. Ten of them saw the giant of fear. Two of them saw the giant of faithfulness. And I'm, get, I'm asking you today, which giant do you see on your battlefield? Fear or faithfulness? Which one do you see? Which one do I see on my battlefield? I want to speak to someone. Maybe you're watching online. Or maybe you're here and you just you feel like, you know, I don't know if God's big enough to fight my battles. Let's just be honest, okay? We're in church, man. Let's be honest. Like, you feel like, man, I, maybe God hurt you, or maybe he didn't answer the prayer in the timing you thought he should, or in the way in which you thought he would. Whatever reason, you're like, you know what? I'm on a battlefield right now, and I, if I'm honest in front of everyone today, I don't know if God is big enough, strong enough, or cares enough to fight the battle that I'm facing, to fight the giant that I'm facing. You know who thought the same thing? Moses. If you rewind the tape from chapter 14 of Numbers back to chapter 11 Numbers, there was this little incident. Well, if you remember, God was providing manna every day, food. It would just magically appear on the desert floor. How cool is that? You don't have to go to Fry's. Okay, it's right there. Boom. It's right there. And what happened? The people started to grumble. We want meat. We're tired of this magical food that just appears on the desert floor. It never, ever runs out. I don't know how you did that, God, but like we're just tired of it. We want meat like we had back in Egypt. God says, you've got to be kidding me. He says in Numbers 11, he says, you know what? I'm going to give you meat, 
for 30 straight days. And God's got a sense of humor because you know what he said? He said, it's going to be coming out your nostrils. He really said that. It's in the Bible. Meat's going to be coming out your nostrils. Moses is like, he responds, he says, wait a second. I've got 600,000 men. And that's just the, that's just the, the army. Children, women, everything. You've got 2 million people. He says, where, where am I going to find in the middle of the desert that kind of meat? Meat that would last for 30 days? Like, God, come on, really? He was doubting. Listen to what God, listen to the response of our Lord and Savior, who, by the way, has a great sense of humor. He says, the Lord answered Moses, is the Lord's arm too short? I thought, wow, I just, I was reading, I was like, that's hilarious. I mean, I was, I was expecting, you know, some sort of profound biblical, you know, holier than that. No. Is my arm too short? Now you will see whether or not I will, what I say will come true for you. And what happened? A quail storm. Not a hail storm. A quail storm. He blew in all sorts of quail as far as the eye could see and as much as they could eat for 30 days. They were sick of it. Here's what I'm trying to tell you. We treat God like he's a T-Rex. We treat God like his arms are too short. God, I really wish you could heal me from loneliness, but I know you can't get your arms around me to give me a hug. Or maybe you, I'd like you to help me with my finances, but you can't reach your wallet, right? Or you want to quench my spiritual thirst, but I can't get the water up to my mouth. God's not a T-Rex. And you need to learn to, 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 to speak to, to our battlefield, on our battlefield. You know, what I, you know what I want to challenge you to do this week? It's going to sound a little weird, but it's biblical, and I just proved it. Is I want you to speak when you're in a struggle this week, when you're on the battlefield. Maybe it's a relationship. Maybe it's a struggle. Maybe it's a temptation. Maybe it's addiction. Maybe it's depression. Whatever your battlefield looks like, I want you to speak the words, your arm is long enough. God, your arm's long enough. Because if you said it back then, it's relevant for today. God's arm is long enough to free us and to fight for us and to come through for us in whatever way, shape, or form, and whatever battle you face, he is... We sang about it, right? We're going to see the victory because God's arm is long enough. But, but I know as, as, we're, as we're celebrating this victory, even before it happens through faith, I know there's people who would say... Pastor John, if I'm being honest, I just don't see Jesus on my battlefield. And, and, and sometimes when we preach the word of God, we get fired up, we get excited. And, and, and sometimes it's, it's, we, don't, we don't always, I want to make sure I'm presenting an accurate picture, right? We get all dressed up with nowhere to go, or we get all, all excited, and, and, and you're like, wait a second, that's not exactly the way I see it. Hey, so let me, let me present the, the full measure of the gospel. When I say that they saw him on the battlefield, it wasn't like they, they walked out in the promised land in the midst of that battlefield and saw Jesus with an acoustic guitar, you know? In heavenly armor we enter the land. The battle belongs to the Lord. Come on, Caleb. Come on, Joshua. I'm here. Don't you see me? It wasn't like that. That would be awesome for like a movie or something. That's not, that's not what I mean. What they, would they likely see? They saw the promise. What do I mean? They didn't necessarily see the provision. But they saw the promise. Promise from Genesis 12. The Abrahamic covenant. He said, I will bless you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless your descendants. I will give you land. That's why they call it the promised land. Joshua and Caleb would have grown up. Reading the scrolls, they would have grown up hearing the great oral tradition. They would have grown up knowing about the Abrahamic covenant. They had the promise, even when they didn't have the provision. And here's what I, God gave me this week when I was studying. The promise dictates the provision. Someone needs to receive that like manna coming from heaven. The, the, the promise dictates the provision. The provision points back to the promise. But you say, well, I, I, Larissa, you don't see the provision yet. But guess what you do see? The promise. I know what you're walking through. And I know it's a tough battle, girl. And you might not be able to see the provision yet. So you cling to that promise. 
When you can't see the provision, what do you do? Point to the promise. Maybe you have a wayward child and you say, God, I don't know how this is going to work out. He's, he's messed up. He's on this. He's on that. And he's into this. Cling to the promise. Raise him up in the ways of the Lord and won't depart. Cling to the promise. Point to the promise today. We've got the promise. Someone asked me this past week, they said, he said, uh, volunteer, Pastor John, tell me, just tell me that we're going to get that building soon. Just tell me as his sweat's coming off his brow. You know what I did? He's talking about the, the, you know, the building we're going to build. We, we, this is, I don't know if you know, this isn't our home where we rent this. Kind of cool, but we don't own it. And um, like next week, right? I mean, it'd be nice to meet on Sunday, but we can't because they own it and they say it's a national holiday, so we have to meet on, on Saturday. It's their building. Someday we'll have our own, right? So, so they asked me, they said, just tell me that it's coming. You know what I said? I'm going to point you to Philippians 4.19. My God will meet all your needs according to the, his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. I'm not, I'm not taking that weight. My shoulders are way too small, but his are big enough. That's the promise. I cling to that promise. And let me just tell you, I read an article this week. Uh, my, Pastor Michael sent it to me. And um, it said that not only have 20% of the churches closed since COVID. So 20%, one in five churches gone forever because of COVID. But now many churches across our nation are going to every other week because they can't get enough congregation members to meet every week. And mega churches aren't even opening because they can't get enough volunteers. And I read that and I just said, wow, thank you for the promise you gave me and the subsequent provision that you provide. I, I, it's amazing what God's doing here. We don't have, we don't have a shortage. And check this out. Last week, a guy from out of state, doesn't even go to this church, sent us a check for $10,000. I'm not done. I'm not done because the promise dictates the provision. That wasn't just some sort of cool line that sounds, you know, alliteration. Like, actually, that's truth, okay? Uh, so yesterday, my son Levi, over there on the camera, I wanted him to tell the story, but he's like, Dad, I don't want to. I should make your little butt come up here and tell that story. <laughs> so... He, he's working with uh, someone in this church who has a moving business, right? Mark and his son, John Schiffer, they have a moving business and they hired Levi to go help and they're at this lady's house. And while at the house, they begin to, my son and Mark both shared about this church that they love and it's set up tear down and we don't have a building, blah, blah, blah. So the lady walks out and hands them $1,000 cash money. $1,000 said this for your building. She, she hasn't ever come here. Isn't that cool? Thousand bucks. I'm not done. I'm not done. Um, so, it turns out this is actually true. The promise dictates the provision, okay? Um, so, today, in the lobby, just about an hour ago, a couple walks up and they said, You know what, Pastor John, we got an inheritance. And we feel like it's biblically right to tithe off the inheritance we got. And uh, we, we want God's maximum blessing in our life. And, and the funny thing is, it's what you can't see. Because they could have never told me, right? I never would have known about that money, right? It's what you can't see that is a measure of depth. Okay? Handed me a check. $50,000. One step closer to that building. God is faithful. <laughs> and the promise dictates the provision. Lastly, if you want to go deep with God, are you ready for this? This is the hard part. This is the part you're not going to like. This is the part you're going to like. I'm not coming back to this church because he, he preaches the word of God. <laughs> he doesn't water it down, sweetheart. Help me feel better about my, my ways. No. You want to go deep? There's no secret. Jump in. Jump in. Verse 24. But because my servant Caleb has a different spirit. Oh man, that's the kind of spirit I want. I want God to say that about me. John's got a different spirit. I'm not there yet, but I'm trying. 
Caleb has a different spirit, a deeper spirit. And he follows me wholeheartedly. In other words, he jumps in. And listen, I will bring him into the land he went to, and his descendants will inherit it. So not only will he bless him, but he will bless the generations to come. That's Proverbs 20, verse 7. The children of the righteous will be blessed. Your faithfulness, your obedience, your depth ain't just about you, y'all. It's about the generation that will come after you. It's about Cason, little Cason, who will grow up and be a fighter largely because he sees people who fight, people who obey, people who strive not to just play it safe, but can see things that aren't there. They're not visible to the naked eye. Here's what I want to tell you. Stop dipping your toe in the water. Stop dipping your toe in the water and expecting the full measure of God's blessing. I don't know why God's not blessing me. God, why aren't you blessed? Because you got your stinking toe in the water. He says, jump in. Trust me. I made the stars. I made the beautiful white tank mountains that the sun disappears magically behind every night. You're not going to trust me? Jump in. Stop dating God. Stop taking God on a test drive like he's a car. You can just return if you don't like it. We've got to be people of obedience. And, and, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm preaching. This is like, to, to me as much, like I'm, I'm with you all in this. Don't hear someone trying to beat you up. I'm not trying to beat you up. I just don't want you to settle. For so many years of my life, I played the game. I phoned it in. And God woke me up. He revived spiritual resuscitation. And I came to life. And I'm like, man, God, I wasted so much. So God says, I know. But I was always here with open arms. When you were ready to jump in, I was always here waiting for you. And God's saying that to you today. He's waiting for you and I to jump in. To not be victims, not be wounded ducks because of something someone did or something someone said. And, and choose to live out the, you know, this pitiful little Christian life. No, no. I refuse that. The best days are to come. Obedience, it brings blessing. But I want to keep it real. It also brings stressing. Obedience brings blessing and stressing. Blessing because of the promised land, right? But what do I mean by stressing? Well, think about it. For 40 years, they walked around camp. And all those Israelites that would, knew they would never make it into the promised land looked at Joshua and Caleb and like, because of you guys. I mean, imagine that. Waiting for tens of thousands of people to die off being the guy that was in part the cause of all that. They would have rather gone back to Egypt and who would blame them, right? As opposed to just dying in the desert, know that you never... Blessing is a part of obedience, but so is stressing. Jesus, we sang about earlier, was obedient to death. Obedient to death. Obedience is heavy, which is why people don't obey. Obedience is kind of like Swallowing a big old rock. <laughs> who, who got up and came to church and served in some form of capacity today? Raise your hand. Just raise your hand. You're not getting any special credit. And Jesus is going to come down here and give you, you know, manna from heaven today. But for those of you that raise your hand, to some degree, you swallowed a rock. There's one volunteer I met out. She's having some dental work done. And her mouth is a little jacked up right now. And I, she, she, she told me that. I didn't say that. But I didn't see it because she put a mask over her mouth. Finally, a good use for those masks. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. All right? All right? I mean, I'm kind of not kidding, but you know. And our Facebook feed went down. Oh, crazy, right? Obedience. She said, you know what? God said I need to be here. And so... My mouth is a little messed up, but you know what? I put a mask over here and I'm serving. She's out there serving. I thought, man, that's what it's, that's what it's like. Obedience is heavy. It's like swallowing a rock. When you give, when that couple gave $50,000, that $50,000 would buy a lot of stuff. And plus, we never knew about it. But God said, you give your 10%. It's like swallowing a rock. That's heavy. Some of you, maybe God's calling us to quit something, right? We, Christianity isn't just what we start doing. It's oftentimes what we stop doing. 
And maybe God's calling you to quit something. Maybe it's a substance. Maybe it's a a thought life. Maybe it's a, a relationship. And God's saying, you know what? Quit it. It's like swallowing a rock. It's heavy. Maybe God's calling you to attend a family circle. I mean, you know, that's some time. That's some investment. And, and sometimes church people can be funky. You know what I'm saying? Like I've been to, I've been to some, some, some church groups that I'm like, y'all are crazy. No wonder people think the church is crazy. But maybe there's something, maybe it's not just about what you get out of it, but maybe it's also what you bring to it. Obedience. That's heavy. It's like swallowing a rock. You say, well, what is, what's the purpose of obedience? What's the purpose of, of swallowing all these rocks? Answer, depth. It's through obedience that God brings a different spirit, that God brings a deeper spirit. Crocodiles, they have the unique ability to live in the deepest parts of the water. For an hour at a time, they can take their very buoyant bodies and somehow magically go to the floor of that body of water where it's deep. What's the secret? The secret is rocks. In any alligator stomach, what you can't see What you can't see is 10 to 15 pounds of rocks that they intentionally swallow to decrease their buoyancy, therefore taking them deep into the waters. God's telling us to jump in. He's saying, jump in, swallow some rocks, be obedient to what I'm speaking to you because I want to take you deep And it's in the deep places that God will teach us those deep truths. It is there where we will, once and for all, learn to be certain of what we do not see. Because it turns out that depth is a measure of what we can't see. Let's pray. Today, as we finish up this, uh, this series, I just, I just feel like there's some people here that say, you know what, this series has been for me and, and, and this word from, from God today is, 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 um, is an anointed word because it's speaking to the very need, the very place that I'm in. And I just wanna give you an opportunity to respond to God. I'm not gonna ask you to get out of your seat. I'm not gonna embarrass you. I'm not gonna call you out, but I am gonna ask you, to make a signal to God that you're, you want to go deeper and that you're ready to go deeper and that you heard his voice. Maybe it was today. Maybe it was uh, when Pastor Michael spoke earlier in this series. Maybe it was uh, the first week of, I don't know when it was, but you're hearing the voice of God. Maybe it was at home before you came. The Holy Spirit got a hold of your heart and you just know that you know what? I'm gonna, it's time for me to go deeper. It's time for me to jump in. I'm stop, I'm gonna stop dipping my little pinky toe in the water and I'm gonna jump in and, and I'm a little bit scared. I'm a little bit nervous. I'm a little bit trepidatious, but you know what? I'm gonna trust you once and for all because you have a plan for my life. And I'm just gonna say, God, today's the day. I'm not gonna ask you to do anything other than just, just say, you know what? That's me today. With every head bowed and every eye closed, if that's you today, just raise your hand right now. Just raise it up. Raise it up to God. You're not raising it to me. You're raising it to God. Raise it, and, and, and don't be ashamed. Raise it high. Raise it high. Raise it high. Let them see. Let them see you're ready. Let them know that you're ready. Let them know that you're serious. Let them know that you're ready to jump in. Amen. Amen. Lord, thank you for those people who raise their hands, God, for the commitments that are being made to you, God. You see those commitments. You don't take them lightly. You say it's better to never, to never make a vow than to make a vow and to break it. So, God, we take this very seriously. I just pray that you would... Uh, Reward those who earnestly seek you. Those who are, are, are jumping in today, they're, they're, that's a measure of, of depth, God. They're, they're saying, I want to live with the certainty of things that I can't see, by the certainty of things I can't see, God. I'm jumping in. I don't have all the answers. I don't know how it's going to work out, but you know what? I know you're calling me to do it, so I'm jumping in. God, thank you. Protect them, bless them, keep them, secure them, preserve them. 
Let them see the provision that stems from the promise. And even when they can't see the provision, let them know that the promise was spoken. And when you said it, that settles it. Thank you for that, God, for that truth. In Jesus' name, with every head bowed and every eye closed, before we go, if you do not know Jesus, whether you're watching online or you're here today, you don't know Jesus and you want to make Jesus your Lord, simply pray a prayer like this. Say, Jesus, I need you in my life. I can't live apart from you. Forgive me for my sins. Use me for greatness in this life as I make you Jesus, my Lord, my Savior, my God from this day forward. I exist for you. In Jesus' name, amen. Can we welcome those people in the kingdom of God? Come on. Come on. We like to celebrate. And you know what? We may have lost a brother, but it's not really a loss because God's redemptive plan is so cool that we get to be together forever with Victor and all of the other saints that have gone on to be with Jesus. Why? Because you made that decision. You made that profession of faith to accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, just like Victor did. And that means we're all going to be together soon enough in eternity. Amen. I mean, listen, if you, have, if you have a need, we have our prayer team and our pastors, our elders are going to be up front. We'd love to pray with you and journey with you. Quick reminder before you leave, next Saturday, not Sunday, next Saturday, 6 p.m., we will be here. No live stream on Saturday. This is in service only. You're either here and you see it or you miss it. But if you do miss it, you can catch our live stream of that service, of that Saturday night service at 10 a.m. on Sunday morning in your pajamas not here. All right. Listen, guys, let's leave this place with smiles on our faces, shoulders back, and knowing that we can live, we can be certain of things we can't see. And that, my friends, is a measure of depth. It's what you can't see. Amen. God bless you guys. Have a great week.